these are just resplendent examples. What connects these more than anything else is great patronage. Here you have the supreme patrons of the Renaissance spending their money on remarkable, utterly remarkable works of art. The first is the finest a theatrical play manuscript to survive from the Middle Ages. It's a script for a play. The play takes four days to perform. Um, it takes 108 actors to, to, to put on. There are directions for special effects. There's, there's a, a cast list at the front. It is the finest medieval play script to survive. There really is nothing after the fall of the Roman Empire in the way of substantial records of drama. And what you end up with is, is drama falls away. It's unimportant in the, in the Dark Ages when Europe is just trying to survive. And it falls away and it doesn't really come back until the 12th or 13th century when priests start performing little biblical narratives at the front of the church in order for the masses to see the Bible story in front of them. These then grow and evolve into the large mystery plays, the mystere, and that's exactly what this is. This is the grandest mystery play manuscript to survive from that period. It was made for Philip the Good, the Duke of Burgundy, uh, the greatest art patron of the Northern Renaissance. After his death, it passes to his son, again the Duke of Burgundy, Charles the Bold, and from there it passes to the collection of Maximilian I, the Holy Roman Emperor. It then slumbers in Brussels, in, in the Ducal Library there, until the 1630s, when it was probably given away by gift to a Frenchman uh, called the Marquis de Vauville, and then it enters the court of Louis XIV, and is finally sold to an English aristocrat, John Carr, Duke of Roxburgh, whose sale in 1812 took 45 days. It was the greatest and grandest book sale there's ever been. It was bought at that sale by the 6th Duke of Devonshire, and it remains in the House of Chatsworth today. The play manuscript made for Philip the Good is in breathtaking condition. It looks like the day it was made and presented to Philip the Good. The colours are crisp, the vellum is white and fine, and these are really in breathtaking condition. Louis de Grutrouze's uh, manuscript, of course, it's, it's, the, it's the romance of Gillon de Tracinier. It's a swashbuckling romance of chivalry and bigamy, and that sounds terrible, but it's, it's not. Gillon is a crusader, and he takes off for the Holy Land on crusade, and on the way back, he's captured by the Sultan at Cairo. Um, and the, the Sultan has him uh, stripped to the waist uh, and, and tied to a stake, and he's going to be killed by people firing arrows into him, in the manner of St. Sebastian, how he died. Um, and at the last minute before they start firing the arrows, um, uh, the Sultan's daughter, uh, called Gracienne, catches sight of Gillon's naked torso, and the text says she falls deeply in love with him. And she persuades her father, Father, don't have him killed, give him to me. These two books are made probably no more than one or two years apart, and they're made for men who knew each other by first name terms. They're both bibliophiles, they're both book lovers. Um, and here you really do see when there's an enormous amount of wealth to be spent on art, two men's different take on Burgundian art. <laughs>